What if you were trapped on an alien mothership and put into a death game, where every two minutes you had to vote for who would be the next one to die? What would you do? This is one of the most horrifying scenarios imaginable, and there's an unbelievable twist at the end that will leave your jaw on the floor. We're here to break down the mistakes made, what you should do, and how to beat the voting death game in circle. Everyone in this room is about to kill each other. The game begins with 50 strangers landing in two large circles in the middle of a pitch dark room. They're each standing on their own bright red dot, circled around two rings of arrows with a mysterious black orb at the center. One woman tries to step forward, but as soon as her foot breaks the circle, a loud buzzer sounds, warning her to stay put. And the same thing happens when she tries reaching out to touch the marine standing next to her. Just then, another woman wakes up, but she quickly starts to panic. Terrified, she steps too far out of her circle and is immediately killed by a bolt of energy from the orb. Suddenly, another buzzer sounds as the room is flooded with bright light and everyone else finally wakes up. Seeing the woman's body, one man freaks out and tries to run, but he's also killed by the energy beam, making it clear that stepping out of the circle means instant death. The others all stand perfectly still while everyone's trying to figure out what they should do next. No one wants to make the next move, but the more time that passes, they can hear a deep pulsing noise that sounds like a countdown. One guy is about to say something, but as soon as he starts to speak, the energy beam kills him for seemingly no reason. While everyone else is busy freaking out, one guy finally learns how the game is going to be played. Looking down, he notices that one of the arrows is white, and he can move it left or right by motioning in both directions with his hand. With the timer counting down, he selects a woman and closes his fist, locking in his decision, and sure enough, she's also killed by the beam. The arrows are how they're going to cast their votes for who they think should be sacrificed next. But you can only see your own choice. Every two minutes, one of them is going to die working their way down from 50 until there's only one survivor. The next round almost goes by without anyone voting, but one of the players secretly makes a choice at the last moment, killing this nerdy waiter. Okay, this is absolutely crazy. These people were just going about their daily lives until now they're suddenly contestants on some kind of demented alien reality TV show where getting voted off the island means finding out what it feels like to have your internal organs microwaved into Nickelodeon slime by an energy beam. This makes Survivor look like a walk in the park, with the worst part being that you're relying on 50 other average Americans to put just as much value on your life as their own. And I think we all know what the chances of that are. You'd probably have better hopes of survival if you fell into a tiger cage wearing a suit made out of Wagyu beef looking like Lady Gaga at the 2010 VMAs. Nobody knows why they were chosen or what E.T. and his friends are hoping to learn from all of this, but the rules are simple and there's only one way out. So I guess the most important question of all is, how would I make sure that I'm the one walking off this spaceship when it's all over? It looks like the answer is going to come down to two main factors, strategy and no small amount of dumb luck. Everything hinges on your relationship with the 49 other people people in this room. So first, I'd start by carefully looking around at the crowd to see what I can learn about my fellow players here. For the most part, everyone in the group seems like they were randomly selected from the greater population with people who represent all demographics and walks of life. We've got a fairly even spread of all ages, occupations, social classes, and cultural backgrounds. But there are two players in the group who immediately stick out like a sore thumb from all of the rest, the little girl and the pregnant woman. Now, as far as the players know, these two being here is just a coincidence, but if you crunch the numbers, you'll quickly find that this explanation doesn't necessarily add up. Think about it this way. Out of the estimated 332 million people who make up the total US population, about 20% of them, or one person out of every five, is a child between the ages of zero and 14. This means that in a room full of 50 randomly chosen people, you'd expect about 10 of them to be kids, which is a significant difference from that one kid that we have here. The opposite goes for the pregnant woman. It's rough math, but according to recent data from the CDC, we can estimate a birth rate of about 50 births per 1,000 women of childbearing age per year. If half of the crowd, or 25 people, are female, 
about 20% or 1 in 5 would fall into this age range. So using these figures, the odds of even a single pregnant woman showing up in the group is about 25%, which means that most of the time, if the group was truly chosen at random, then there shouldn't be a pregnant person in there <laughs> at all. Of course, you're not going to have these exact numbers at the time unless your day job was as a census taker, but your gut instincts should tell you that there's more going on here than random chance. This tells us that the one little girl and one pregnant woman here were almost certainly put into the group intentionally. The aliens who are running this nightmare were most likely observing humanity for a while beforehand and chose to put them both here because they know that little kids and pregnant women are two of the most most highly valued and protected groups of people in human society. Based on this, I'm already starting to suspect that this is more than just a game. This is a test, which of course changes everything. What exactly they're testing for, I'm still not sure, but they've removed the option for physical violence, so they're definitely not interested to see who would win in a fight. The answer is probably that they've set things up this way because they want to see how we react mentally to this kind of stress, and whether we'll resort to manipulation to save ourselves, or be willing to sacrifice ourselves to protect the women and children. Now that we have a better idea of why we're here, it's time to decide on our next move. It looks like the ultimate goal is to be the last person standing, and the way that I see it. There are a few different approaches that we can use to get there. First, you could try taking control of this situation by becoming an early leader. This would mean forming alliances with like-minded players, or coming up with creative ways to manipulate the ones who are more easily convinced to joining your side. You could try to pick up on people's philosophical and moral differences as things get more heated, and quietly spread the seeds of doubt to turn them against each other. Taking control early on might allow you to eliminate the players who you see as the biggest threats, but could also attract too much attention and end up being a quick way to get yourself killed. Otherwise, you could choose to stay quiet instead while getting a feel for the other personalities in the room. This is going to put the early game decisions in the hands of others, but keeps you off of the radar and gives you time to really read the room without drawing too much attention. Either way is a risk, but personally, I'd go with this option for now. Whether you're leading the group or just blending in, it's critical to decide early who you need to eliminate. Right now, I'm looking at the guy in the backwards hat because he killed the lady just to test his theory while they were still figuring out how the voting system worked. I'd also want to take out anyone who starts coming up with ideas because if there can be only one winner, then it's inevitable that they're going to be a threat to my survival later down the line. After all, it's better to have a whole room of followers that you can manipulate than a room full of hotheads who are going to make things more complicated. The key is to play it safe for now, but if all else fails, then you could always try quickly stepping to the side out of your circle, while simultaneously pulling the person next to you in front of the beam. Maybe, just maybe, it'll work and you'll be able to run around the circle using people as meat shields, causing chaos and forcing them off of their dots to end the game in a big blaze of glory. The odds of this playing out successfully are slim to none, but I'd keep the idea in my back pocket as a last resort, just in case I ever knew that I was about to be voted off. With 45 of them still alive, the players all agree to a truce, but the same guy who killed the waiter secretly chooses a lady who was just minding her own business in the background. Everyone breaks out into an argument over what to do next until the majority eventually agree to try voting for the dead woman. They cast their votes, but instead of her, one of the living players is killed with no way to tell what really happened. This time, all of the players agree to hold out their hands as proof that no one is casting a vote. The countdown begins, but when the time runs out, every arrow in the center suddenly lights up white at the same time, and a random woman from the back circle is toasted by the beam, which proves that refusing to play the game is not going to save them. Now this guy in a blue hoodie tries to take control of the situation, and he's come up with a galaxy-brained idea for what to do next. He thinks that they can buy themselves more time to figure out how to stop this by voting for the senior citizens in the room first, since they'd be next to die in the real world anyway. A few of the players express their disagreement, but they're quickly outnumbered, and this grandpa is chosen as the next sacrifice, with the plan being to keep going until nobody over the age of 70 is alive. Okay, well, 
That's one way to get the ball rolling. Is this guy a complete asshole for suggesting to sacrifice the senior citizens first based on nothing but their age? Yes. And do I definitely agree that it's the best choice for now? Also, yes, but you wouldn't catch me saying it out loud right in front of their faces, that's for damn sure. Making early enemies like this is pretty much guaranteed to get you eliminated later down the line, so I wouldn't be the one to suggest this kind of strategy. But I sure as hell wouldn't stop him from being the one to bring it up either. He thinks that he's very clever for coming up with this plan, but by showing his hand this early, he's also just made himself my top target. We can chip away at old people for now, but when the time comes that we start picking some younger players to sacrifice, I'm voting for this guy in a heartbeat because I can already tell that he'd be the first to try and get me killed without a moment's hesitation. Now, we've seen that if nobody votes, then the decision of who's eliminated comes down to chance. This means that there's no easy way out, but it also might be the most fair way to decide who gets to go home, and your own best chance of survival. Let me explain. The only truly fair way to play this game is to leave it completely up to chance and have everyone in the group refuse to vote. Instead of a manipulation and popularity contest, this makes it a 1 out of 50 chance for everyone in there to survive, making the odds completely fair for everyone. While 1 in 50 might not seem like the best odds, it's probably better in the big picture sense than continuing to play the way that they are now. Because either way, whether you speak up too much or don't speak up enough, the eye of the group is eventually going to fall on you. And once that happens, it's all over. In court cases, for example, attorneys often prefer to reach a settlement out of court rather than rely on a jury decision because it reduces the level of uncertainty in terms of the outcome and mitigates the risk of taking a massive L. I'd consider taking the same approach here, because if you think about it, it's probably safer to take your chances with true chance than with a crowd of impressionable and desperate people that might turn against you in the blink of an eye. You don't even need to convince everyone to agree to this system, just the majority of the players. Because if anyone goes against the group and starts voting again, then everyone else will want to vote them out because they'll become a threat. It's not ideal, but it's the only way to remove bias and make the game as fair as possible for everyone involved. Next up on the chopping block is this old lady wearing a hat but that's when things start to get a lot more complicated. She says that she's just 52 years old, making her younger than the others suspected. On top of that, she's a breast cancer survivor, and the disease is in full remission, meaning that she still has a long life ahead of her. This blue hoodie guy still thinks that she should be the next sacrifice, but the older people in the group realize where this is going and decide to revolt, voting to kill him instead. Nobody else wants to speak out of fear of being sacrificed next, until the Marine points out that they must be here for a reason. Perhaps if they can figure out why they were all chosen, and if they all have something in common, then they can finally piece together the ultimate goal of the game. It's the best plan that anyone can come up with, so a woman from the back row agrees to go first, introducing herself as Beth, who works in HR. She goes on telling everyone her whole life's story, boring them all to death until the countdown starts again. And it looks like going first was a bad choice, because they zap her with the energy beam just as she realizes that she's cooked. After this, everyone decides that it might be best to avoid sharing their names to make things less personal. This guy wearing a yellow shirt goes next, but he immediately slips up and says that his name is Craig. The woman standing next to him just so happens to be his wife, and he thinks that there must be a reason for this besides just the luck of the draw. The rest of the players ask if anyone else knows each other, and only one other person speaks up. This guy wearing a blue shirt that was having an affair with the woman on the other side of the circle. Craig here feels the attention turn back to them, so he asks the crowd to choose him instead of his wife if it comes down to that. Everyone casts their votes, and this time, an old woman from the circle is killed. No one is safe yet, but they're steadily working their way down. Okay, this guy Craig and his wife are suspicious. I mean, he just offered to sacrifice himself instead of her when absolutely nobody had even brought that idea up yet, which is fishy enough already. But the strangest thing of all is that his wife here hardly freaked out or even tried to stop him when he heroically stuck his neck out for her. This is sus, and it leads me to believe one of two things. Either they've got something to hide or she's a ruthless sociopath. Either way, I'd want to kill the wife next. 
Plus, if they really are a couple, then they have an unfair advantage with two votes. So eliminating one of them can only be a good thing for the rest of us. Maybe I'm right about these two, and maybe I'm wrong. But in the end, it doesn't really matter as long as two or more competitors end up getting knocked off the board. Because that only increases my chances of survival. The key is to just play it right so that I wouldn't end up as the target myself. After noticing this odd little interaction, I'd casually mention that it seems fishy to the rest of the group, and then let the others be the ones who really get the votes in motion. With any luck, nature will take its course, and Craig and his wife will be the next two to go, bringing me two players closer to freedom. The players then turn to this guy wearing a green and yellow hat next, only to find out that he doesn't actually speak any English. The woman standing next to him volunteers to translate, revealing that the man has three young daughters back in Mexico. But their true colors start to come out when they realize that he's in the country illegally. There's a large group that wants to kill him just because of where he's from, but in Instead, this woman from the first circle is chosen, sparing him for now. All of a sudden, a police officer from the back circle recognizes this tatted up guy in the front. The criminal tries to play it off like he doesn't know what the officer is talking about at first, but the truth eventually comes out that he beat his girlfriend for cheating on him. It's not the first time that he's done it either, and he doesn't regret it at all. Well, it looks like they've finally found someone who deserves what he's got coming, and the others quickly vote to zap him into oblivion, knocking another player off the board. If only they could all be so easy. One of them being a criminal brings up an interesting point, as some of the players suggest that maybe they're supposed to judge whoever deserves to live based on their morals. But not everyone agrees. While they're busy talking it over, this round of voting ends, and a woman from the front circle is killed, bringing them no closer to the truth. Instead of focusing on their backgrounds, one player thinks that there's another factor influencing their decisions. With the majority of the room being white, he thinks that, whether they're willing to admit it or not, they've been singling people out for death because of their skin color. Most of them argue that race has nothing to do with it, and the conversation quickly gets heated, escalating into a full-blown argument until the police officer can't hide his true thoughts anymore. In this case, it turns out that the guy was right. The others tell the officer to drop it, but he just can't let it go, digging himself a deeper and deeper hole with his remarks until finally they all vote to kill him when the round ends. The Marine points out that they're all on the same team, and instead of turning on each other, they should try to force a lie. Agreeing with this strategy, everyone tries voting for themselves, but the machine won't let them do it, so they decide to vote for the person to their right. It seems like everyone is on the same page, but when the round ends, this guy in the blue shirt is abruptly struck dead. Nobody is sure how it happened, but it's possible that it could have been an accident, and they decide to try again. This time, they they actually do get their first tie, but not in the way that they had planned. A pregnant woman and this curly-haired guy are highlighted with yellow beams, showing that they each received the same number of votes. Everyone has to vote again, and naturally, they end up killing the curly-haired guy, which is when this guy, Eric, reveals that he voted for the man because he caught him secretly trying to get the pregnant woman killed. Now that the group's attention is on her, this brings up another big problem. If they can't lie, then only one of them gets to live, and with the young kid and pregnant woman involved, this pretty much means that nobody else even has a chance, unless they're willing to do the unthinkable and vote to have them killed. Two groups start to form, with one side wanting to get rid of the kid and the pregnant woman, while the others want to protect them for as long as possible. The round ends, forcing everyone to cast their votes, and there's a tie between the kid and the older woman, with the woman being the one who's ultimately sacrificed. It's a close call, but with half of the room gunning for her, the kid is still far from safe. Okay, now that alliances are starting to form, they're officially playing an even more dangerous game. Being with the majority can keep you safe for a while, but it'll just as easily backfire if they eventually turn on you or the opposing group takes the lead. The key to survival still seems to be playing things as close to the chest as possible from here on out. With this in mind, I'd make sure to always keep my hands in my pockets from now on so that nobody could see who I was voting for. And this way, I could also maintain plausible deniability to claim that I never even voted at all. Hopefully, neither of the teams will want to vote me out because I could be on their side. 
and the only way to stay safe is if they have no other way of knowing for sure either way. Now, they don't need to know this, but one thing that I do is always vote for somebody at the beginning of each round. That way, if everyone else chooses not to vote or gets so caught up arguing that they forget to, then there's no risk of being eliminated randomly because I've already selected a sacrifice. You have to vote for somebody to make sure that you aren't eliminated by chance, but don't want to make it too clear what your intentions are or whose side you're really on. I like to think that I wouldn't be willing to go after the pregnant lady or the kid, but I guess you just don't know for sure unless you're in this position. For now, I'll give myself the benefit of the doubt and say that I wouldn't vote for them, but I wouldn't stick my neck out to save them if somebody else was going to do it either. Because they're obviously the strongest competition, and eliminating them gives me better chances of survival. Obviously, those two sticking around late into the game is bad for me, but not only is turning against them a morally scummy thing to do, it'll instantly paint a target on your back with the people who don't agree. Whether you're team get rid of them or team good guys, the other side is going to want you out of the way. So it's better to stay anonymous on which way you feel and let the others continue to weed each other out, at least for now. Next, this narc in the sweater vest starts going after the kid, arguing that she can still be a bad person even if she's only 10 years old. The round ends, and this time there's a three-way tie between the pregnant woman, the girl, and and the man standing in the row behind them. He panics and tries pushing them both out of their circles, but is instantly killed by the beam, inadvertently saving their lives and technically dying a hero, even though he's really a total piece of garbage. Not sure who to turn on next, the group decides to start asking for volunteers. It's quiet for a moment, but to everyone's surprise, a few people actually choose to step forward. In the end, this pilot, a teenager, and an old woman all volunteer to be next for different personal reasons, stepping far out of their circles one by one and sacrificing themselves at the end of each round. Okay, while we've got some people volunteering, this gives us a chance to try a strategy that I've been thinking about, but wouldn't want to risk my own life to figure out if it works. That is, going straight for the real threat, the orb in the center of the room, and seeing if you can damage, destroy, or otherwise compromise it in some way. They don't have a lot to work with, but perhaps they could try throwing something really hard at it, like a watch, a belt buckle, or some loose change from one of their pockets, and seeing if they can break it. It's definitely a long shot, but if they're gonna die anyway, why not give it a try? Or how about this idea? After it fires once, maybe the orb needs the next two minutes to recharge. Right after somebody gets zapped could be the time to make a move, but again, I'd talk someone else into trying it first, just in case it didn't work out as planned. Now if that doesn't work, then I might try having everyone who's going to volunteer all step forward at the same time. Who knows, maybe this will cause the orb to overload with energy and explode from the inside. Since the aliens got us in here, that means that there has to be a way out. You just need the right opportunity to go for it. The orb is the only thing standing between you and moving freely around the room. So if you're able to destroy the damn thing or temporarily short it out, then you'll have your chance to look for that exit. And maybe more than one of us can get out of here after all. With no one else volunteering, it's time for the remaining players to start voting once again. And that's when this guy, who looks like he should be working for a Silicon Valley tech startup, starts mocking some of the others for their religious beliefs. Offended, Craig points out that 95% of people believe in a higher power, but this moron responds by calling 95% of people idiots, which turns out to be a very poor choice of words. The voting starts, and it looks like he's about to be the next one to go, but to everyone's surprise, there's a tie between him and this random lady in the back. She ends up being killed, and apparently he's made enough friends among the atheist crowd to keep him alive, at least for now. But it won't be long before the fat lady sings for him too. The atheist knows that the others are going to vote for him next, so he starts looking for someone else to throw under the bus, and ends up picking on this conventionally attractive woman standing next to him, claiming that he recognizes her from spicy movies. The woman denies it, but the truth eventually comes out that she's a homewrecker who's been having a secret affair with her boss. He tries his best to get her killed, but everyone's already made up their mind who's side they're on, and when the round ends, he's quickly taken out of the competition. Okay, wow, just when I had thought I'd seen it all, 
this guy comes out of left field and starts looking for problems with everyone. I could have told you how that was gonna play out, buddy, but don't let me stop you from doing your thing, because one less of you means my chances of survival just went up. I should thank you, but I also have to say, Mr. Silicon Valley, you f***ed up. I don't even think that I need to explain why calling everyone in the room idiots to their faces while his life was literally in their hands was a bad idea, but I will. Being a self-centered, narcissistic asshole here, like walking into a South Philly sports bar wearing a Dallas Cowboys jersey, you'll probably get away with it for a while if you're smart enough to keep quiet. But start calling too much attention to yourself, and it won't be long before somebody who had a few too many Michelob Ultras that morning tries to put you in the hospital. Making your whole strategy going after people in the most personal and derogatory ways possible is only gonna get you killed, but it's a good thing for me because now there's only one less player that I have to compete with to survive. I mean, have you not been paying attention to how this works? So far, we've seen the blue hoodie guy, the cop, and the curly-haired guy all get killed because they couldn't keep their mouths shut. Even poor Beth from HR got killed just for being boring, so maybe staying quiet would have kept you alive a little bit longer. When you try to make others the target, it's only a matter of time before karma comes back around on you. And once that happens, there's only one thing left to say. You f up. Now, Sweater Vest here chimes in that they should spare the players who have children, but the young people in the group aren't willing to play along. Completely out of nowhere, this lawyer starts pressing another random lady for details about her personal life, but she can sense where this is going and refuse to give him what he's asking for. While they're arguing, the round ends, and another random woman is killed. The lawyer starts in with the woman again, and he finally gets her to admit that she's married to another woman. Nobody else seems to care, but this idiot starts getting aggressively offensive about it, saying that it's a good enough reason for her to die. The others, however, do not agree, and they prove it by voting to sacrifice him next. With the rest of the hotheads staying quiet for now, the players start to realize that if they can't vote for themselves, then the game will inevitably end in a tie when there are only two of them left standing, and the only way for one of them to survive is if the other finalist agrees to sacrifice themselves. A few of them say that they would do it, but the truth is that nobody knows how they would react until they were actually put in that position. The round ends, and this time it's a tie between the man and woman who've been having the affair. Neither of them wants to be responsible for the death of the other, so they both agree to go out together, with each of them stepping out of their circles and sacrificing themselves at the same time. As the next round begins, this bearded guy brings their attention back to the pregnant woman and the little kid. He's convinced that getting one of them out of the running now is the only way to make the game fair, since it's not an option for both of them to survive in the end. The group can't decide who to pick, so Mr. Sweater Vest here says that they should choose based on who contributes the most to society, arguing that the world already has enough babies with single mothers who can't take care of them. It's a douchey comment but lucky for him, the round ends before the others can vote him off, and this guy wearing a backwards hat is killed instead. The guy with one arm starts asking Mr. Sweater Vest here what makes him so special, and he argues that he's a wealthy banker who donates large amounts to charity, insisting that the only way to choose fairly is to pick whoever is the most valuable in the real world. Another round passes, and this time the translator is killed, which makes the non-English speaker the next target for the most cutthroat members of the group. Just then, Eric decides to speak up for the first time in a while. He's suspicious that the most ruthless members of the group are conspiring to swing the majority votes to their sides so that they can kill the pregnant woman and child, and starts organizing a team of like-minded survivors to help protect them for as long as they can. Eric, the Marine, the cancer survivor, and the one-armed man team up with the two girls, but they aren't able to get enough votes on their side before the round ends. It's a tie between the little girl and the non-English speaker, with the man heroically deciding to sacrifice himself to buy her another chance. Mr. Sweater Vest here is beyond pissed that things didn't go down like he wanted, and the Marine calls him a scumbag for trying to throw an innocent little kid under the bus just to save his own life for a few minutes. Refusing to back down, Sweater Vest shouts that they need to get rid of both the pregnant woman and the little girl right now. That way, at least everyone else will actually have a fair chance at survival. It's time for another vote. And this time, the round ends in a tie between Mr. Sweatervest himself and his arch enemy, the 10-year-old girl. 
Thinking quickly, the ruthless group decides that they should force another tie so that both of them will be eliminated, but only Mr. Sweater Vest ends up going down, and honestly, good riddance. It turns out that Craig's wife here decided not to vote because she couldn't sacrifice a little kid. Okay, right now, this room is as divided as it's ever going to get. One side wants to take out the two weakest links to give everyone the best chance of surviving, while the other side wants to protect them. They're ready to kill each other any second now, and there must be a way to use this disagreement to your advantage. If it were me, I'd continue trying to turn them against each other by feeding into the argument without committing too much to either side for as long as I could. I'd keep my votes secret and start switching sides back and forth without letting anyone catch on. That way, the alliances will start to doubt even the people they've aligned themselves with. And we can whittle away at the competition without creating an overwhelming majority on either side. But you still need to be careful, because remaining a wild card for too long might turn both sides against you. Eventually, you're going to have to pick a side just to stay alive. When we reached that point, I'd observe who seems to be the most in the lead and team up with them just as a way to preserve my own safety. In terms of voting, I'd quietly go after the most outspoken person on the opposing side, either the sweater vest guy and his team or the one-armed guy and his people. It's going to be tricky as more players get eliminated, but you need to continue playing the game as wisely as you can to ensure that you stay alive for as long as possible. Furious. The bearded guy argues that no one really wants to get rid of the kid, but it's what needs to be done whether they like it or not. He has his supporters, but the one-armed man still disagrees, arguing that they should accept their deaths with dignity and stop trying to use these two innocent people as human shields. He's made his point, but the majority rules, and at the end of the next round, the one-armed man is killed, slowly whittling away at the pregnant woman and the young girl's only line of defense. The ruthless group agrees that it's time for the Marine to go next, but he quickly suggests voting for Craig's wife as a way to put her husband's loyalty to the test. With his wife's life on the line, Craig makes the last minute decision to switch sides, and they end up killing this asshole who's been coming after the kid the whole time, leveling the playing field once again. Craig and his wife aren't off the hook yet though, because now the bearded guy is out for revenge, and he wants to know what the odds are of a husband and wife ending up right next to each other when everyone else seems like they were chosen completely at random. He's suspicious that they aren't married at all, but made it up to avoid getting voted out and starts grilling them about their personal information. They're able to keep it up for a while, but the truth finally comes out when Craig's wife here can't even remember her own husband's name. With the round about to end, Craig decides to admit that it's true, trying to shift the blame onto the woman as if it was her idea. But the others vote to kill him for lying, and now there's only 11 of them left left. Seeing his chance, the bearded man starts trying to swing as many of the others as he can over to his side. He starts out by telling Craig's so-called wife that the only way for her to have any chance of getting out to see her real family again is by teaming up with him, and uses the same strategy on the woman immediately to his right. So far, it looks like his plan is working, but the ruthless people still can't come to an agreement about who they're going to sacrifice before their time runs out. The round ends before anyone can make their choice, and this time it's a five-way tie, with only the bearded man surviving the bloodbath, with the marine, the cancer survivor, and the two other women are all eliminated in one turn. Now there's only seven of them left. The bearded man quickly realizes that he only needs one more vote to get the majority, and starts trying to convince the pregnant lady to turn on the kid, but after thinking it over, she refuses to do it. Eric won't turn on them either, but suddenly the pastor sacrifices himself, unable to bear the stress of everyone being at each other's throats any longer. With the way things stand right now, the next round can only end in an unwinnable tie between Eric and the bearded man, so he decides to make Eric an offer, trading the little girl for Craig's fake wife. To his surprise, Eric here actually agrees, but there's still one more player who hasn't given his opinion. They vote one at a time until it finally lands on this guy, wearing a button down who hasn't spoken a single word the entire game. But in Instead of choosing, he refuses to vote, and the phony wife ends up being the next one killed. 
The bearded man is shocked. But Eric points out that the quiet guy hasn't voted once during the entire game, which might be how he's managed to fly under the radar and stick around for so long. Naturally, Beardy here wants to sacrifice the quiet guy next, but the others have different plans, and he's finally eliminated from the group, leaving only Eric, the pregnant woman, the little girl, and the quiet guy still standing. It's down to the final four, and with no other choice, Eric, the pregnant woman, and the little girl vote to sacrifice the man in the button-down shirt, who quietly accepts his fate, going out as the only true gangster of the entire group. Okay, this is it. We're down to the final three, and there can be only one survivor, but how do you choose between yourself, a pregnant woman, and a little kid? Personally, I can't say how I'd feel unless I was really in this situation, but like we said before, the most fair thing is to leave it completely random if you aren't willing to sacrifice yourself to save them. If you leave it up to chance, then the odds are one out of three that you'll still get to go home, and you don't have to live with the guilt of sacrificing an innocent person for your own survival. Although it's not perfect, it's the only way to make this really fair in the end, but one of these three is about to make a shocking decision that completely changes everything. With time running out, Eric reminds them that once he's gone, one of them will have to sacrifice themselves so that the other can live. To everyone's surprise, the little girl actually volunteers, and Eric says that he'll go with her, agreeing that they'll both leave the circle at the same time. But that's when Eric does the most savage thing imaginable. At the same instant as the girl steps out of her circle, Eric casts his vote for the pregnant woman and both of them drop dead, leaving Eric as the only survivor, or at least that's what he thinks. For some reason, the game does not end, because there's still one more survivor on board. Suddenly, Eric is surrounded in a beam of yellow light, with the other one hovering over the pregnant woman's stomach. He didn't come this far to sacrifice himself now, so Eric raises his hand and casts his final vote. Sometime later, Eric wakes up in the middle of the LA River with several enormous alien ships hovering in the sky overhead. As he makes his way through the streets, he comes across a group of survivors, including kids and two pregnant women. They are the only ones left after completing each of their games. And now, he'll have to live with the memory of what he was willing to do to survive. Wow, that sh was crazy. I can't believe that it all went down like that, but... In the end, were you even surprised? Let us know down in the comments below. Thank you so much for watching. Leave a like and subscribe and check out that How To Beat playlist for more videos just like this one. Big shout out to our writers and editors who are putting in the Lord's work for making this show possible. And of course, you, the viewers. I love you guys and I'll see you on the next episode. Have a damn good day.